we are still waiting for my call for more colleagues to to come to to join this meeting but uh, but we are about to start so first of all i would like to start with the with the technical things that you you must know i'm sure that you already know after almost three years with these meetings but please uh, remember that uh, we have translation today we have four different languages and you can choose them you can select them in the in the in the globe that you have in, on your screen if you want to to speak you must raise your hand that in the bottom that you will find into the reactions and also that uh, when you raise your hand and we will we will give you the floor you need a proper headset in order to to that we can listen to you properly and and use a microphone um, you have already seen the message saying that this meeting is being recorded. So if uh, you have uh, any question, please let us know. You can contact with our uh, colleagues uh, that are in charge of the technical part through the chat. So now I would like to, to start to open this uh, first webinar. This is the, the first one out of this uh, action week that we are uh, arranging this, this week around the just transition topic. And I would like, first of all, to give the, the floor to our Assistant General Secretary, Kan Matsusaki, that uh, he, will, he will make the opening remarks and, and give you some the, the introduction to, the, to this week. So Kan, over to you. Thank you very much, Diana. So uh, uh, sister and brothers, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, to everybody. Uh, so thank you very much for your time participating uh, this, uh, the first, uh, the webinar series on the just transition uh, this week. So um, as you, I think as you are already aware that Industrial uh, Global Union has launched a global campaign called the United for Just Future, a time to pay up. As you see uh, my uh, background effect, you know, you see this campaign logo uh, behind me. Uh, so we set up, uh, you know, uh, the 12 building blocks for a just future, uh, which are the, the workers' rights, uh, collective bargaining, union density, decent wages, uh, social protection, uh, human rights, uh, gender equality, global solidarity, distribution of wealth, uh, food and energy security, social dialogue, and just transition. So for the just transition, uh, we, need, uh, we need a funded plan. Uh, developed through the social dialogue to manage transition to net zero and replace carbon intensive work with quality, green, and most importantly, unionized job. As you're already aware, from next week, uh, the COP27 uh, will take place in Egypt. And International Labor Movement, uh, ITUC, us, Industrial Water Union, together with other uh, global union federations, uh, we will continue to demand and promote a uh, just transition at COP27, starting from next week. And industry all said this week as a just transition week uh, in order to share our position and our demand uh, on the just transition uh, prior to the COP27. So this is why uh, we actually organize this series of webinar. So today, uh, this is webinar session number one. Uh, we will focusing on uh, just transition, union demand and finance of the transition uh, with a special focus on the COP27 and our uh, union demand. And tomorrow uh, we will have webinar session number two, uh, which will be fight for just transition throughout the regions and industrial supply chains with specific focus on oil gas mining sectors, as well as uh, Middle East, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa regions. That, that, that is a tomorrow. And day after tomorrow, then we will have a webinar session number three, uh, which will be industrial, uh, which it, that will be the joint webinar anyway. Uh, this will be uh, the industrial together with uh, International Transport Workers Federation webinar uh, that will be uh, focusing on the just transition in the mobility sector, then special focus on the maritime sector. And all, we would also organize a social media storm on the 4th of November, so Friday this week, 
uh, to make our demand clear uh, ahead of COP27. So I will uh, explain about the detail on our uh, social media storm campaign uh, on this Friday uh, at the later stage of this webinar. But today, yes, we focus on this COP27 and our union demand. And uh, maybe some of you already have already noticed that the, you know, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change, uh, UNFCCC, they recently uh, released a new report uh, on this uh, climate uh, crisis. And they already mentioned that countries' climate, uh, climate pl uh, pl promises plan are still not enough to avoid catastrophic global warming. Uh, each country has this uh, NDCs, what we call national determined, uh, determined contribution, uh, meaning the country's national effort to tackle emissions and mitigate climate change. But uh, this is not enough. Uh, if we keep this energy as it is now, uh, which will lead our planet, planet to at least 2.5 degrees warming, then I think you all are aware that limit uh, of the global temperature uh, should be below 1.5 degree Celsius rise. So, so uh, this is a quite serious situation that we are facing right now. Uh, the executive, secu uh, executive secretary uh, of the UNFCCC, uh, he quoted uh, as follows, uh, COP27 is the moment where the global leaders can regain momentum on the climate change, make the necessary pivot from negotiations to implementation, and get moving on the massive transformation that must take place throughout all sectors of society to address the climate emergency. So he actually mentions uh, get moving on the massive transport, uh, transformation must take place all sectors, but which means uh, our workers, our members are mostly affected by this massive transformation. We uh, in the Global Union and our members are facing his historic changes and transformation. So whether we like it or not, uh, climate change uh, and transformation of ex existing jobs are happening. Uh, according to uh, international energy agencies, uh, 2.7 million jobs will be lost in coal, oil, and gas sectors by 2030. But on the other hand, there is also a huge opportunity in the new field, such as renewable energy. The clean energy, for example, is expected to generate 10.3 million net new jobs globally by 2000, uh, 2030. But the question is, is those newly created jobs a good green union, unionized job or not? So this is why we need to uh, get involved as much as we can uh, in the just transition processes. So now uh, this just transition process must be accelerated and we need to catch up the speed of the change and transformation. Uh, the last year at COP26, after the campaign by the International Trade Union Movement, uh, the Just Transition Declaration has signed by countries in the Global North countries, including US, Canada, UK, European Commission, and a number of individual European countries. So where see countries have pledged funding for the climate change mitigation and decarbonization efforts in the poorer countries, mainly in the Global South. And this funding uh, will now be subject to the just transition principle. Now we are heading towards COP27, which will focus on the finance and implementation of the just transition. We need to prepare for the just transition planning and make sure our workers' voice are reflected into the just transition processes. So this is why uh, we have uh, the, uh, this uh, webinar session number one today. So later today, uh, we will hear uh, the very basic principle, which is uh, what is a just transition 
And Diana also uh, will explain about this, uh, you know, the question. And also uh, she will explain, uh, she will talk about uh, the guide of practice of just transition uh, we have recently published, uh, which uh, include how the union can build the just transition strategy and plan uh, for the future. Then uh, we will invite uh, two experts from ITUC, uh, Bert Deruvel, uh, he's climate policy officer from ITUC, and also Samantha Sumis, uh, director of ITUC, just transition center. So they will uh, explain us about the uh, what are the union just transition demand at COP27, uh, led by ITUC, and who will pay for the just transition and finance scheme for the future. We, we will also focusing on this joint project between ITUC, ILO, and uh, US Global Union, uh, uh, no, uh, ITUC and LO Norway and uh, Industrial uh, Global Union, and what will be the key demand uh, in the energy sector, and what will be the industrial uh, priorities for uh, just transition for the future. So that will be the contents uh, today uh, for the webinars. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, to fruitful uh, the webinar uh, today. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ken. So now I will I will give myself the floor in order to to talk about what is just transition and and how uh, we understand that this process has to be has to be done. Um, when, when we talk about this uh, just transition, Khan already mentioned the, the climate change and that this is something that is happening now and it's something that we have to deal with. So in order to reduce this, um, this the human activity that, uh, that is, is impacting and, and, and damaging the environment, we need to, to tackle it, but in a way that uh, it can, the, the issue is that it can uh, mean a loss of, of jobs and also it will need reskilling of, of uh, people, of new jobs and, and new opportunities. And uh, what we don't want and what it means just transition is that we cannot leave anyone behind. So because of that, the, the, the main idea and how this just transition works is that uh, the change to a uh, to a greener um, economies and to to have the yeah the greener uh, industries? It has the potential to create uh, millions of jobs, but also it has to be decent jobs. It has to promote uh, social justice and and development of uh, of the of the of the jobs that we are having right now but also how people can, can adapt uh, themselves to, this, to these changes. And this is what we, we are all going to discuss today, the new skills that are needed, uh, how the finance is, is coming, where this is coming from, and, and the best ways that, uh, that we, can, we can use uh, all, all this. Also, um, we will need stronger systems of uh, education about uh, reskilling and uh, for workers in order to adapt them to, I mean, for them to adapt themselves uh, the best way for the, for the future. And also we will need social protection that has to come from, from the government. Um, regarding all this, uh, Industrial is, is working uh, in, in different areas. Uh, this this uh, Action Week is, is one of them, but we are also uh, acting in different, different other places. And one of them is the, is the guide of uh, Just Transition that we just published uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we are uh, setting up the scene uh, to understand why we are here and why we need to take action right now. Uh, in this guide, I would like to, to share my screen very quickly. In this, um, in this guide, what we are, uh, what is, is uh, ideal in order to support our, our affiliates and to, to give them the opportunities to, to see how they can make their own plan for this just transition and how they can they can do a step by a step with the with the guide. So wait a second. Yeah, here I cannot find it. Yeah, the bottom. Yes, you should you should see the screen now. So this is the guide that we have uh, that we have published. Uh, I will not um, I will not um, 
bring a lot of details. We have already made a webinar on this. Uh, it's already published on our website. You can find it in, in different languages and we are translated in, into more languages. But just for you to have an idea of the content of this guide and how you can, you can use it, we are using the concept, the concept of a high bar just transition. It means that we need a real just transition and the high quality. We, we don't understand um, a transition where uh, workers are not part of this and, and where they are not consulted and with a very low uh, quality. We understand that it has to be um, for everyone, everyone has to be involved and also it has to be uh, positive for the, for not only for workers, but also for their families and the, and the communities. Um, this guide is something that we are also uh, working on it and we would like to, to you to work on the, on the guide, but also receive your feedback and, and we can update it and we can, we can work with, uh, with all of you. But just for you to see uh, the, the parts, the first part is about the political context and the economical context, why we are here and why, as I was mentioning, why do we need the, the transition? The, the just transition and, and to, to have this, this process with, a, with an order that we can all follow. And the second part is a, how you can, you as, as union, as, as affiliates, you can build your own strategy and your own plan in order to make this, a, this just transition something successful for, for your workers. Um, as I was mentioning, you have to take action today. This is not something that we can wait. Even if you don't feel that uh, the changes or the transformation is happening, it's something that you have to start right now to think about it and to, and to develop the plan. And, and we are um, bringing the idea of uh, getting all the information that you need. Uh, when we talk about just transition, is a uh, is a tripartite process that is defined uh, at the ILO with the ILO guidelines on, on just transition. And we always talk of uh, three parts, the government, the employers, and the workers. These three parts has to be, has to be, there, has to be there and needs a social dialogue uh, in, in all these parts. And the first thing that you need is to get information from all these parts, who are your allies and, and, and with, with who you can, you can work and develop uh, your different strategies. So first are the governments. You need to know all what they are doing regarding the, the, the investments, uh, the, the, the energy plans that they have, how is the transition uh, moving in the country and the, the targets that they have settled for the, for the future. So you need to compile all this information. Same around the companies. If you are uh, talking to a company that is planning a, a transition, you need to know exactly what is the company, um, what is the company planning, uh, what are the targets that they have set, um, how they are going to make this transformation, the impact that this is going to to have in in workers or not. Do they have a collective bargaining agreement or not? What is the situation with the, between the, the union representatives and the employers in this company? Do you have a dialogue or, or not even, even that? So all this information is what you need to, to compile. But also when we talk about the workers, workers representatives, unions, who are your allies? You need to, to bring together all your allies and identify them that they could be the social, uh, the civil society could be NGOs, could be um, another unions that are also uh, taking part in the, or that are uh, sharing the same sectors with you. So you need to work with all of them, talk to them and make the best plan that works for everyone. You also need to develop a strong argument and in order to, to, to share it with, uh, with your unions, with your colleagues, but also with the, with the employer when you go to show the, the plan that you have and also with the government if you are discussing with, uh, with them. But also executing the plan. How can you, how can you make this real? You need, to, you need to think about this plan in the short, medium and long term. You need to think how you are going to develop this plan in the next month, next three months, 
uh, six months, one year, two years, but also in the mid and long term. Uh, what is going to happen in five years, in 10 years? Where do you think that you, the unions, are going to be in this, in this process? You need to think about all that and try to plan it. For sure, in 20 years, you cannot be very detailed because we don't know what is going to happen in 20 years, not even next week. But you have to try to imagine at least where do you want to see your union, your sector, your industry in 20 years in order to, to make this, this plan. But also about financing the just transition. And, and we will see it uh, later in the next intervention that we will have from, from Bert, that uh, we will talk about financing just transition. This is something that it, it is it's not going to happen immediately and it's not going to, to happen for free. For sure, we need finance. And we need to know where the finance is coming from and, and where the ideas that we can get uh, in order to, to, to accomplish with the entire process. But also building union capacity. We need also to work with our affiliates, with our colleagues in the, in the different industries in order to, to help them to understand the entire process and, and, and what can happen and for them to be to be aware and, and to have their their eyes their eyes open to see that the, this process is coming and how they can be part of this of this process but also it will be it will be good to create a different committees at different at different levels could be a local national or regional or global level but also company level where you can you can decide and, and discuss the different uh, areas where you can where you can proceed or where you need to invest more more time in order to to get this uh, this plan done. And in this guide, we have also prepared a set of um, indicators that are very generic, but maybe can help you to 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 follow uh, to follow the plan and to see how you can you can continue or you can keep going and to see if, if you are right or if you are missing missing something in the in the process we also prepare um, a generic timeline uh, following as is set in the in the guide um, as i was mentioning you need to have the idea of what are you going to do in the next six months in uh, in the night in the next nine months in the first year in the second year so what is the plan so this, this can help you to, to follow it um, a bit. But also we have made a checklist where you can go and check if you are going uh, in or, or making all the steps that you have to in order to not uh, missing any, anything, any information and, and so on. These are all uh, examples that we included here in order to, to support you in this, in this process. And something that we also thought that could be could be useful for you is uh, is the what it appears in the appendix that is um, is a specific language on just transition that could help you in order to to include the just transition parts in your different collective bargaining agreements. Could be only one sentence if if you don't have more room to 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 negotiate anything else with the with the with the company but could be one sentence could be one paragraph or you have also examples of uh, entire chapters on just transition but also entire documents a proper uh, just transition agreement that you could use in order to to develop it properly with with the company that will be the the idea and also if the government will take part because as we were saying before the three parts are, are needed on this, that will be the, the best option. So I don't want to, to extend the, more this, this presentation. It's, it's something that, uh, that you, you already have and that we have already, already talked about that. And I would like now to give the floor to Berdewell that uh, can already introduce him. He is the Climate Police Policy Officer in ITUC. And he is going to talk about our demands, what is the plan for COP27, where we are uh, going and we are organized, but also about the, the, the finance scheme of this, of this just transition and who is paying for, for what. 
So Bert, if, um, if okay. you are ready. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure to, to be with you and, and share our demands uh, for COP27. Um, in fact, uh, the, the introduction to my presentation by uh, Ken and by Diana has been perfect. Um, you, you have made the road uh, already very clearly on, on where our demands come from. I will say one word about my job. So I'm the climate policy officer at ITUC. This means that I'm uh, um, taking care of our demands on the multilateral level towards United Nations uh, regarding our climate uh, demands. I'm the focal point for the trade unions at the UNFCCC and the head of delegation at the, the COP, um, for example, this year, next week, starting in Sharm el Sheikh. We will probably have some like nearly 100 trade union delegates uh, on the ground in Sharm el Sheikh. This sounds like a big number, but if you think that there will be 30,000 um, people in Sharm el Sheikh, this is really a small drop. Um, I also would like to, to know that my I'm, I'm very much dependent on you, all the people on this call, for in order to do the work um, that, that we are doing at the global level. And I'm very happy with the presentation by uh, Diana, with the, the guide on how um, these just transition policies are implemented on the shop floor in, in the companies, um, because this is crucial. Um, you can run ahead of us in the implementation of climate policies. We can run ahead in at the global level uh, with demanding just transition demands, but they have to go in tandem. They have to go together. And if we are well coordinated, we can have the, the biggest impact um, on the global level, but also the global agreements can support your work on, on, on the ground level. So that was like a, a first introduction that I would like to share with you. I will uh, share my presentation. I hope that it works. Um, if you see it, um, then I will go through it. Yeah, very good. Um, so the climate negotiations, uh, as you might uh, um, see in the name of the, the conference, COP27, this is like the 27th COP that we are organizing uh, since many years. And um, the main focus of these climate conferences every year has been on negotiating an agreement to implement climate policies. And in fact, last year in Glasgow at COP26, it was an important moment where um, these negotiations uh, came to an end point. Uh, the countries finalized the Paris rule book, um, the rule book on with the, the rules to implement the Paris agreement. That's so important to, to get all the countries on the same line in with their climate policies. Uh, there were also important declarations last year on the, the importance of science, which is becoming more and more important in the climate debate. And for the first time, they spoke about a uh, phase down of unabated coal and inefficient fossil fuel sub subsidies. They made direct references to uh, ending coal and these fossil fuel subsidies with our just transition. This was uh, very important. But one of the main uh, points, and we come back in with, um, with our demands, is that there was no uh, agreement according to the developing countries on loss and damage. So the, the damage that we already see to, today by uh, climate change, mainly in developing countries, uh, how to compensate for these losses and the damage done, uh, this was the, the main point that uh, was not uh, dealt with at um, at the, the COP last year. And this will then be the, the, the challenges uh, for this year. Um, as Ken also indicated um, uh, in his introduction, last week there were a few important reports. Uh, the UN, UNEP, the Environment Programme, and UNFCCC um, came out with reports that indicate that our emissions are still going up. After 27 years of negotiations, we see, uh, you can see it on the black line on this graph, emissions are still going up while they should be going down. In 2030, we should have a reduction with minus 45%. 
And with the plans that are now on the table, we, we see that it will probably lead to an increase of emissions, uh, even with 10% still uh, compared to 2010. So we, we are faced with a major uh, emission gaps problem that we have to deal with. And as the UNFCCC, all these countries together cannot impose on the countries to reduce their uh, emissions, it's a process where every five years countries present their plans, uh, the nationally determined contributions, and then all the countries together evaluate them and, and chart a way forward how uh, to improve and, and make better uh, the joint uh, initiatives of the countries. But this is a very, yeah, sometimes frustrating process uh, because uh, everybody sees that we are not making uh, enough process and that progress. And that's why observers like the trade unions and civil society play such an important role at these uh, conferences to make governments accountable and put pressure on it um, to indicate to, to the ministers and negotiators it's about our jobs, our livelihoods that are at stake if you don't take ambitious uh, policies. One uh, positive report that also came out last week was the global uh, the World Energy Outlook from the International Energy Agency, where uh, Fatih Birol, the, the director, uh, indicated that he, he is quite positive that, um, in fact, the, the war in Ukraine, with the huge Im negative impact that it's having now, is putting the, all the countries, is putting the world on uh, this path to um, um, low carbon, fossil free, uh, um, for the first time, have Peak, a peak in fossil fuel production and consumption in uh, in the, the near future. And also important that the golden age of gas, uh, where many are were referring to, is coming to an end and that we really are setting in uh, on the development of renewables. So, and these are the, the important challenges that we are faced with um, at um, the COP and where we want uh, the labor voice to be heard. And the, the main concept, uh, you, you have already explained this, is are these two magical words. We wanted um, these climate policies to integrate just transition plans, and they need funded plans based on social dialogue um, that provide decent jobs, social protection, and training and skills opportunities uh, for the people that are affected by, by global warming and by climate change policies. That's um, in a nutshell, what, why we are going to these uh, conferences, what we are demanding. And, and we put it very big here um, and, and repeat it all the time. Um, everybody that says, just transition, what do you mean? Uh, I don't understand it. It has so many uh, meanings. No, it's in the Paris Agreement. The more than 100 con 180 countries have agreed to it that it's uh, a just transition of the workforce the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally def def defined development priorities. So just transition is about workers, about decent work and quality jobs. And that's what we have to remind um, everybody that engage, engages uh, with, um, with climate policy. And as, if we speak about decent work and quality jobs, then we make immediately the link with the ILO. And the ILO has its um, guidelines for just transition that give a very good menu, an overview of all the issues that we have to deal with if we want to make, uh, to implement policies that create decent jobs and quality jobs. It's about these skills development that uh, Diana spoke about, but also about, about occupational health and safety rules and that have become a fundamental norm at the ILO since last year's conference and, um, and, and are an important instrument to protect the impact of global warming on workers. These are instruments that we can use um, at the global level, but also at the company level in the collective bargaining agreements that you're negotiating to, to put uh, climate higher on, on the agenda. So what's, what are our demands? Um, we, we, have, um, we have seven uh, demands. First, um, we, want, uh, we are very happy that many governments speak about, uh, many actors speak about just transition. 
Um, this is an opportunity for the global labor movement that everybody speaks about our concept. Now it's an opportunity also for us to use this uh, space in the policy debate to put our uh, demands on just transition, the um, workforce focus of just transition uh, to the fore. So that will be one of our main jobs in Sharm el Sheikh to remind all the negotiators that it's about uh, a worker's agenda. And then something that many of these environmental negotiators do not understand is that uh, labor rights are human rights. The protection of the fundamental labor rights as defined in the ILO are human rights. And if you want to build trust in society that's needed to implement ambitious policies, then you have to guarantee uh, human rights and labor light rights um, it, with your climate policies. This is, of course, also a very tricky point with the host country organizing the climate conference. Egypt has major issues, major problems with the recognition and the functioning of labor unions in Egypt. And we have expressed our, 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 our huge problems with these, uh, the situation of our colleagues in Egypt to the Egyptian government. And um, we want them to make progress with this as they promised uh, at the ILO. We also want a uh, fair participation of all observers at uh, the conference in, in Egypt. And this is going to be a major issue uh, probably uh, during the negotiations. So the, the climate negotiations are, are divided in a few main teams. And the, the first important team is we have to reduce emissions. I already indicated it 45 to 50% by 2050, uh, uh, 2030 reaching net zero in 2050. These are huge changes that are needed. And we see that the, the G20 countries, in fact, are lagging behind, are um, not picking up this challenge sufficiently strong enough to, to put policies on the table that will actually reach these reductions. And we propose very specifically that by introducing just transition uh, aspects in your uh, mitigation policies, this will allow you to be more ambitious to, if the impact in society is being uh, organized in a fair and just way, then you can raise the level of ambition uh, of your climate policies. So that's the first uh, demand that we, we have. But we see already that the climate is changing. We see it now everywhere in the world. And that's why we need also adaptation policies. This will be very high on the agenda because the impact of climate change is the hardest in countries on the continent in Africa, we, where it's al already happening since many years. So especially developing countries are asking for much more attention to their problems with adaptation to climate uh, change. And we also, from the labor movement, we propose to include in these policies, um, concerns, policies, money, uh, measures, to introduce social protection uh, measures in their climate policies. If you want more money for adaptation, then we say it should go to social protection uh, among other aspects, like 4 billion people in the world do not have any social protection. And then if you're affected by floods or you lose your job due to a heat, um, a, a too high heat, a heat crisis, um, then um, you need health care, health coverage, and uh, unemployment benefits uh, for these people to deal with this impact of climate change. We think that the, the labor movement, together with the social partners, for example, in the ILO, have good proposals uh, to deal with these issues. Also, at the UN level, there is the accelerator that pleads for uh, a, gl a global uh, fund for social protection. But like first, we have not done enough with mitigation and we have to step it up. We see that there is already climate impact and we need more attention to the adaptation to it. But there is also the impact already today of uh, climate change with floods and hurricanes, most recently in, in, in Pakistan, leaving like millions of people without uh, any livelihoods and homes and having lost of their jobs. Um, so also there, um, and especially developing countries are demanding um, concrete commitments by the rich countries from the global north 
on how they're going to finance, compensate the impact of uh, the climate crisis that we are seeing already today. And there seems to be progress in this area. Um, many of the rich countries do not want to, to commit, to, commit to any liability, responsibility in terms of climate change, like they have caused the problem, so they should also pay for the impact of it, and they're very hesitant on that. Um, many countries are speaking about insurance schemes to deal with this, but then you see that uh, certain businesses, insurance companies are going to earn money with the impact already of climate change, and this is probably also not a solution. Uh, while it can be part of the solution in certain uh, aspects. So this is going to be a very important um, uh, aspect of the negotiations where, as it is happening in Africa, especially the developing countries uh, are asking for progress. And then climate finance, it has already been mentioned several times. It's always uh, the other side of the coin of the climate negotiations. How are we progressing with mitigation? But on the other hand, how are we helping developing countries on their path to low carbon development? There is the promise of $100 billion a year that had to be on the table by 2020. We see it has not happened. The, the, the money is, has not been provided by the, the rich countries. Uh, the developing countries uh, are asking, where is the missing money? And where's, what's the goal for the coming years, uh, the long-term uh, goal for uh, climate finance? And everybody knows that $100 billion a year, if you see the impact of climate change and the needs to make the transition to low-carbon uh, economies, um, and this uh, target has to be raised, has to, has to get higher. And, um, and this will also be a very important uh, aspect of the negotiations. Also, the type of finance that they are speaking about, um, uh, more and more of this climate finance is uh, our loans, while and, and a very small portion is grants, and these loans are contributing to the debt situation of many countries uh, that many countries are faced with already. So this is an other aspect, the qualitative criteria of this climate finance. And we think, and we, we want to raise attention to a declaration that was signed last year, um, that, that specifically um, refers to these just transition criteria that we all know very well and to have them inter integrated in all aspects of climate finance. Um, uh, this is not going to be very easy um, because uh, many of the, the governments seem to forget uh, what they declared only less than a year ago. Um, so we, we will need all our lobby capacity, advocacy capacity uh, to, to raise this point uh, higher on the political agenda with uh, the countries uh, in Sharm el Sheikh. And finally, this is um, a team that's um, a bit more technical. Um, there is uh, one aspect in the negotiations, it's called response measures, um, where um, countries speak about economic diversification and just transition and we think that this is um, a good place where we can have more technical discussions with the countries on how to implement uh, just transition policies but often um, there's two problems with this uh, um, this discussion um, it's it does not receive um, high enough uh, political attention of the in the negotiations, and second, yeah, we are not at the table. So, um, and that's um, always one of the crucial aspects of uh, just transition. Um, it's based on social dialogue. It's based on discussions with workers at the table, and um, that's why we all are also asking. That's one of our demands to have a formal representation of the global trade union movement in these discussions on uh, response measures. Um, yeah, these are the, 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 the demands that we bring there. I just wanted to flag two other things, that there will be a global day of action on the Saturday in the middle of the two weeks of the climate conference. Um, as it's it's not possible to set up big manifestations, rallies in Sharm el Sheikh due to the very strict control of the Egyptian government. This will be a decentralized global uh, action. 
Um, more information will certainly sh be shared on, on social media. And also on, on the Sunday in the middle, uh, we will have like um, trade union strategy day where it's also possible to participate uh, digital, uh, at least to the, to the, um, the plenary uh, uh, sessions of this strategy day where we invite workers and rep worker representatives uh, to participate in. Diana, um, this was uh, my introduction or my overview of our demands um, for COP27. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bert. Thank you very much for this comprehensive presentation. I think that is, is clear what are our demands as, as unions uh, for COP, uh, but also I think that uh, it's not only our demands, I think that we need also to understand our role uh, and not only during COP, but also during the entire year, what is the role that we have as unions uh, and how we can put some pressure on our governments and lobby them in order to, to get what, uh, what we want to, to get, not to get the, the demands. So thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to open the floor for questions, comments, discussion, whatever you want to ask uh, Bert. Does anyone, I cannot see, yeah, wait a second. Okay, yeah, Robbie Berenstein, please introduce yourself, yeah. You're we, muted. Cannot, we cannot hear you, you're muted. Yes, uh, <coughs> excuse me for my voice. I have a bit of a fever. Uh, first uh, remark and then my question. Uh, I want to, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, all trade unionists, especially the Brazilian trade unionists for the election of Lula. And I, I think that is a major step also within this uh, matter uh, uh, we are talking about uh, in the sense that uh, he has announced uh, measures against deforestation in the Amazon, where I'm also part of, as uh, my country is also part of. So congratulations on the election of, of, of uh, the Brazilian president Lula. <coughs> That's first. Secondly, uh, I have it here a clear demand uh, on education. Education in the sense that within the transition process, there will be needed a lot of uh, retraining, you know, bringing, you know, uh, giving workers other skills that the new jobs demand, uh, uh, the way it's, how it will be financed, uh, maybe in the seven demands a little bit, but, but I miss a clear demand on education, retraining of workers within, within the transition process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, totally, for sure. I mean, the, the education is something that we have to bear in mind and, and because it's, it's key for the reskilling of, of workers and the needs that they, they are going to have in the future. It's something that we have to bear in mind. And also governments need to make proper plans for, uh, for education in, in, the, in the transition. Uh, thank you very much, Diana. And thank you very much to the entire team present with us today. 
Um, let me talk a little bit about North Africa and the Near East. I think the situation can be summarized in two words. Just transition is essential. We need to move absolutely from one phase to the other. Transition needs to be just. It could be a revolution for us, considering our economies and what they had been relying on in the past. It means also that we will have less reliance on fossil fuel, for example, and this would mean uh, less reliance on fossil, fu fossil fuel, as I said, would lead to perhaps reforestation to the fauna and the flora being restored in certain areas. Perhaps this is something very interesting. However, I highly doubt that uh, these objectives can be attained by 2030. And uh, I highly doubt that by 2030, we will have decent job opportunities for everyone. However, perhaps a first step could be taken on. And this means that a social dialogue needs to be started at the earliest stages possible. And this means also that we need financial resources to be dedicated to uh, to changing skills to improving skills to transition to social dialogue we need also to have priorities set uh, so uh, just transition means that we need to set our priorities and it means also that we need to allocate the resources available to those priorities first and then to the rest because let us be logical we will never have enough money to do everything uh, and remember also that just transition will have to cover all of our national territories and these are very large areas we're not talking about a small a small city where just tran just transition is needed we're talking about entire countries and these are very large geographical areas and it makes it very difficult to have the right amount of financial resources first and to have uh, to have wide enough plans to cover everybody and cover every worker who will need better skills. This is therefore a work that will need to be done day after day on the long run. This requires also a tripartite dialogue and a dialogue that would encompass all workers. This is something that would encompass all of us because all of us are concerned. Thank you. Shukran, Butayev, thank you very much. Bert, do, would you like to, to respond to these two comments? Yes, uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you for the uh, comments. Um, one of the, the points that I was going to reply to uh, was uh, already uh, said by Butayev in his last part of his, uh, of his question. Um, I think that indeed it's, it's very complicated to set priorities, but on the other hand, um, we, it's my um, huge conviction that um, we only can do this by going to the core business of trade unions. Um, we, what's our job? Defend the, 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 the rights, the livelihoods of workers. And that's what we have to pick up in this. And everybody in the trade union movement has to pick it up. Like 10 years ago, um, 15 years ago, when I started in a trade union movement, um, environment and climate issues were for the environmental policy advisor. Um, if he was the he or she was dealing with it, it was okay. Then the the, the union was was doing a good job. But I think um, with the huge transformational changes that we are um, need to implement, uh, as uh, Mr. Butayep was also indicating, uh, reducing with fifty percent in 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 less than ten years is is huge. It will will have a, a huge impact. This means that climate change, the transition, is a job for everybody in the union. Um, everybody will has to have to integrate it in his or her work uh, uh, in the trade union movement. And then, in terms of priorities, um, yeah, it's true that the priorities are different if you compare a trade union in Norway or in in Tunisia or in in Ghana. And um, these priorities have to be uh, um, determined and selected in function of the national realities. But we can always fall back on the, the concept of fundamental labor rights. So 
freedom of associations. Are we allowed to, to act as trade union on these issues? Uh, social dialogue, do we have a place at the table to, to raise our voice? Uh, collective bargaining, what are we delivering for our members on the ground in the companies? And, and then um, if you uh, deal with these issues, uh, concepts as skills development are, are part of these demands and uh, with instruments like the, the, the guide that has been presented by Diana, I think we, we can build on our um, collective uh, knowledge as trade unions to represent the interests of workers and integrate the challenge of environment environment climate change and environmental issues in this and that's i in in my opinion it's uh, the only way that we can have um, any impact in in this discussion thank you thanks a lot Bert, for your response um i can see that the allow day is also asking for the floor the floor is yours Assalamu alaikum, ala Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. I am from Iraq and I represent the uh, Iraqi Union for Electricity. I would like to mention one thing. Iraq is one of the largest oil exporters across the world. And voice is breaking, I apologize. I would like to mention that there are problems inside the country. Inside the country, we have poor security, no stability. Uh, we've had wars, war for years. We have huge reserves of oil and natural gas. However, we have no good investments. Oil and gas are not extracted properly. Even when extracted, um, there is no proper way of doing things. When you try extra extracting uh, oil and gas in the country, you can notice the black, dark clouds above cities, above entire cities, because extraction is not done properly, which leads to an increased level of climate impact, of impact on climate. Uh, natural gas is not exploited well as well. Iraq imports natural gas from Iran, despite the fact that we have natural gas in the country and we are unable to extract our own natural resources. Imagine we need to import from Iran about 20 million, about 20 million worth of natural gas, although we have plenty of natural gas inside our country. So we extract oil improperly uh, and we do not extract natural gas although we do have some and Iraq on top of this has a, a lot of problems when it comes to stability, security, politics and others. Let us look into other things as well. In Iraq we have sun, we have the sun and we have solar power. We can build a lot on we can build a lot on, sol on solar power. We have 70 hours of daylight inside the country. We could have invested much more in solar energy, and yet we don't. Uh, and this means that the problem has to do with organization. It has to do with policy and priorities. We could have resorted to assistance from other countries. We could have benefited from the help of the United Nations and United Nations agencies. However, all the uh, assistance effort we've received so far have ailed, have failed. I believe therefore that the problems are endemic. We have national legislations about oil extraction, gas extraction, uh, and solar power and uh, cleaner energies. The bill has never been approved. The bill is still somewhere in a drawer. It was a bill we started working on in 2017. And from 2017 and up until now, there is still nothing. Today, the Ministry of uh, Electricity announced that it wants um, Iraq to turn towards cleaner energies. What have we done so far to do this? Nothing. Uh, there are beautiful announcements, beautiful resolutions, beautiful demands, but do we have actual planning to reach a point where we actually steer away from oil extraction towards greener, cleaner er energies? 
not yet. So far, if I understand correctly, uh, there has been an agreement with the Siemens company. I believe it is uh, one of those projects with Siemens is about a wind harvesting facility. And uh, this might be a very positive thing. I believe as well that we've had an agreement with Norway to produce a cleaner energy, uh, a cleaner electrical energy. But so far, what is the implementation status of all of this? Not much. Uh, furthermore, I would like to point out that in Iraq, we have about 200,000 people working in the electricity sector. I, can, I know this because I work in the electricity sector. But what will be the reality of our electricity workers once we move towards cleaner energies? And uh, I'm not even talking about the people working in oil extraction, natural gas extraction. Those people will face an even more difficult situation than ours because so far there are no plans to allow for people to move from one sector to the other. For some of us, we belong we are considered civil servants. Civil servants are in a way protected because as a civil servant, it's very hard to kick you out of the job. But we work in essential field. We work in fields where we are needed. But despite the fact that we are civil servants, we get no real protection, no welfare, no social protection from our government. And this is the last point I wanted to raise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sukran. Um, regarding, you have mentioned different different things, and, and I totally agree that a proper a, extraction or, or man, management of the of the natural resources is needed and and that's why it's so important to be organized and to be able to put some pressure in the in the government um also you were you were mentioning that uh, some the political stability is is also key that's that's for sure but uh, about the the different um technologies that are also uh, coming out and, and you were mentioning that in, in Iraq you have a lot of uh, sun that can be also used for, for new new energies uh, and what you were mentioning with the uh, Siemens if I'm not wrong I think that that is an agreement about hydrogen and is a, it's an agreement between uh, the Siemens and the Iraqi government in order to to bring the, the industry, to produce green hydrogen uh, in Iraq and to to develop it in in, in the country uh, in order to yeah to produce this this hydrogen, so it's something that we also need to be aware about these different agreements and how we can also influence the the, the countries. Um, I don't have any other hand raised. I don't know if Bert, you would like to to give some final comments. I just wanted uh, to to react to the um, the intervention of our colleague from Iraq. Um, two things. Uh, I think we have to take very careful um, note of the reports, for example, of the International Energy Agency, where the global energy market is, market is developing, and this will also have major change changes for the oil producing countries. Um, he refers very clearly to the way that uh, national governments maintain control and direction over their energy policies. Uh, and this includes, of course, all the workers that are uh, working in, in the energy sector. And um, we have to step up our attention to this and uh, our work on, on strategies to deal with the economic diversification, uh, the, de the decarbonization of energy production in, in, in oil producing countries. And, I just wanted to raise this because next year, the the following uh, International Climate Conference, COP28, will uh, take place in United Arab Emirates, uh, an oil producing country. And so this, these items, these problems uh, will be once again very high on the agenda. And it's our responsibility as a trade union movement 
to to lead in this debate, to have an answers to Allah, uh, to participate in in the discussions on on how the transition will be beneficial for the workers. That's the comment that I wanted to make. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bert. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so no one else is asking for the floor. May yeah. I comment? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. I apologize for the interpretation. I did not uh, catch the uh, interpretation at the end because the sound was breaking. So could you please repeat the last idea you said? What uh, Bert uh, said, we did not uh, hear the interpretation. We uh, did not hear the sound at all. Okay. Um, I was indicating that the conf climate conference uh, COP28 next year in November will take place in United Arab Emirates. Um, they will organize the following COP. And this means that um, the climate challenge for the oil producing countries in the Middle East will be very high on the agenda and that we as trade union movement have to be prepared for this debate. And being prepared for this debate means, among other things, have an answer to the, the important questions that Allah uh, uh, was mentioning in his intervention. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for the clarification. Um, okay, so now that we don't have any other hand raised, I would like to give the floor to Samantha Smith. I see that she is already prepared. She is the director of the Just Transition Center in ITUC as well. And she will, she will talk to, to us about the joint initiative that we, we are developing, Industrial, ITUC, and ELO Norway, about the just transition in the energy sector. So Sam, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Diana. And hello, comrades, sisters, and brothers. Nice to see everybody. Um, I'm just going to put some slides up on the screen to uh, take you through the basics of this initiative. Some of you have already seen this, so apologies uh, to those of you who who have been with us through the 10 workshops that we've already had in, in this Just Transition, the Energy Sector Initiative. So here we go with some screen sharing. One sec while I get started. Um, so the... Um, while I'm trying to get my presentation up, let me just say a few words about the uh, about the initiative. So the purpose of this initiative, or the the way we got started, was that um, during during COVID, as you will recall, during the lockdowns, the price of oil and to some extent the price of gas crashed, and hundreds of thousands of our brothers and sisters who were employed in, in jobs in the energy sector around the world lost their jobs more or less overnight. And there was there was talk about you know a, a fundamental change in energy markets and how these jobs might never return. And, and yet here we are um, a couple of years later and uh, oil and gas prices are incredibly high. They're so high in fact, that it's actually bad for industrial jobs, for example, um, for jobs that, that require lower cost energy, such as lower cost natural gas. And it's also not good for households, right? If you're a working class person, a poor person, even a middle class person, energy prices across the board in most countries are, are super high. So uh, with that as a background, um, we also, wanted to, we just wanted to be sure that our members, so our members who are represented through ITUC, so that's everybody, but especially industrials members who are represented through energy sector, mining, uh, power, oil and gas union, steel, and so on, that everyone has the tools that they need in order to make these plans that Diana uh, and Khan have been talking about. 
right? Because whatever, you know, whatever anybody thinks about climate change or whether we're going to meet climate targets, the thing is that governments and employers seem pretty convinced about this. And I think all of us can, either through our own experience or the experience of our comrades at the workplace, we can see that things are changing. They're going to continue to change, and we just have to be ready. Because if we don't make plans ourselves, if we as workers are not organized and uh, planning for a just transition and putting forward our demands as we've heard, then someone else is gonna do it for us. And we're really not gonna like the outcome as we've already heard from, from our brother in Iraq. So let me put up my presentation now that I've got it and uh, walk you through what we've done so far with the initiative. Um, so I talked a little bit about the about the uh, uh, the re, you know the motivation for doing this right and just to be clear it's a cooperation between ITUC, LO Norway which is the national confederation in Norway ITUC affiliate obviously many many members in Norway in the energy sector and industrial and what we what we what we wanted to do was to work together to make sure that the union movement has the information, tools, and plans we need to get good jobs and just transition in this chaotic period. Because again, as, as we can all agree, the energy sector is in the middle of some massive changes. There's more to come. We don't know exactly when these changes are coming in some cases, but we know that they are coming. And we know that not only because of things that are happening in the global climate negotiations, but just things that are happening even at the company or the sector level or decisions by, by national governments. So we had two parts in this initiative. One is uh, pretty practical. We just finished it. It was to provide a table for unions around the world to exchange information, examples, and strategies for good jobs and just transition in the energy sector. And although we were focusing a bit on oil and gas, I think, again, everyone can agree that now there's a lot of crossover between different parts of the energy sector, energy-intensive industries, even transport and construction. So the information that we were exchanging covered everything from mining for coal and critical minerals to different ways of generating electricity from coal and, uh, and renewables. Um, we're probably going to do something next year on nuclear, just, just as an FII, but also covering some of the end uses and some of the new technologies like hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Because what's happening is that governments and employers are putting out these plans for change in the energy sector uh, with big investments, potentially in wind, onshore and offshore, in, uh, in carbon capture and storage, in hydrogen, in solar and batteries. Um, and they're saying that they're going to make these investments pretty quickly to bring down emissions. So in some ways, that's a good thing. But at the same time, we as trade unionists, we don't really know what, the, what their plans are because they're not sharing them with us or we're not involved in social dialogue to make those plans. And we don't know how many jobs there are in these in these transition pathways in these technologies and we don't know if people working in the energy sector today are going to have the skills that they need in order to get these jobs and will these jobs be good jobs will we have rights at work um, which is maybe the most important point so we wanted to get together globally and to have these digital workshops with everybody participating from big energy producing and using countries, but also other countries, in order to explore what these commitments to net zero emissions that Bert mentioned, what does it actually mean for jobs? Then the second part was to explore the potential for a new tripartite process anchored in the UN and focused on just transition in the energy sector starting, but maybe not finishing with oil and gas. And this process would promote and oversee new global just transition agreements between international energy companies, trade unions, and governments. And the purpose of this second part was really just to get another tool 
to drive the employers to the table for social dialogue and to get them to be transparent about the plans that they're making and also to involve us in the plans that they're making. What we did in this initiative, we had uh, we had 10 workshops, as I mentioned. Um, in the start, we were trying to cover different time zones, have workshops at different hours of same workshop, different times of the day. That was a lot, uh, but also also a good idea in terms of of getting every giving everyone a chance to be a part of of this initiative. But we had a kickoff meeting, uh, and then we went through some of these technology pathways to, again to look at how many jobs there were: hydrogen, onshore and offshore wind. Uh, we had a couple of country workshops where comrades from from different unions around the world shared experiences with just transition, especially in the energy sector so far. They gave examples. They talked about their challenges. Um, everyone could ask questions. Then we we covered solar batteries and mining. We went to look at the value chain. So everything from mining the critical minerals all the way up to installing, manufacturing, installing the solar panels manufacturing the batteries, how they get used in uh, electric vehicles in order to capture where the jobs are. Um, we had just had a session on carbon capture and storage. And then finally, last week, we had a, a sort of stock take where we presented some draft conclusions and recommendations and got feedback on them. They've also been sent out by email. You may have received them. And if if you did, great if you want to, to comment on them. Um, see what we missed, make any changes. We're next, the next things we're going to do, we're going to go to the climate negotiations. We're going to have a side event actually um, with the ILO in their pavilion where we will present these conclusions and recommendations. We'll talk about the process and then we'll say, like, this is what the trade union movement has, um, has discussed in this process. And here, here are some of the things that that we concluded and some of the things we recommend. Um, we're gonna do the same thing at the ITUC World Congress in Australia. So we'll have as part of a climate and just transition event, we're going to have a panel with our general secretaries, with Atla, with Sharon, uh, and with, with Peggy, the general secretary of LO Norway. We'll have interventions from the floor and a bit of a bit of a discussion. And then there will be a technical meeting in the ILO about the future of work in the oil and gas industry, where industrial and uh, whoever you have in your delegation, you're going to talk to the ILO also about this process. So when we get to December, we might be a little tired, but then we will uh, then we'll have a debrief. So we'll take the feedback that we've gotten from you and from ITUC affiliates um, and from LO Norway and we'll look at what the next steps are. So on to the conclusions. So maybe the most important one, um, which, uh, which we're also hearing on, on, this, on this webinar, is that energy sector unions, uh, uh, industrial affiliates, and our, our ITC affiliates, the national confederations, are mobilized on the issue of good jobs and just transition. So you understand the change is coming. You understand what just transition is. You're working on it or trying to um, in your different contexts. And uh, that's something I think we can uh, really be proud of as trade unionists, that our movement is actually mobilized on this issue and uh, working now to implement it, though sometimes stopped by, stopped by employers and governments. Um, the second thing is what we already discussed. Most of us have experienced changes to jobs and even job losses, as well as new organizing opportunities in clean energy. And so we know there's more coming. We want to be ready for it. Affiliates, our members are very interested in information, examples, and exchanges with other unions, and particularly focused on these issues of good jobs. How do we keep the good jobs that we have today in the energy sector and energy intensive industries? Um, how do we make the new jobs good jobs? And how can we be sure that we as trade unions are at the table negotiating, not just being consulted, not being shut out of the discussion, but actually negotiating these plans? We we see that the employment in the oil and gas sector has increased 
because of rising oil and gas prices and rising demand. We can never be sorry when our members are employed. At the same time, we know that this is not gonna last forever. So again, we have to be ready for change, even if we don't know exactly when it's coming. We also you know, found agreement across our movement that high energy prices are not good for anyone in the working class, and they're worst for poorer countries and households. High energy prices also threaten jobs in intensive industries, uh, energy intensive industries in every country. In the technology workshops, so we, we heard some sort of big figures from the IEA. Um, we've heard uh, similarly some bigger picture figures from, from the ILO. Um, and certainly everything indicates that in this transition to clean energy, there are going to be uh, more job, more new jobs created than, than we will lose jobs. But uh, at the same time, but at the same time, there's no single energy technology or activity that is going to involve as many jobs or as many quality jobs as we have in today's oil and gas sector. So the future is going to be complicated. It's not as if we're going to have, you know, a new hydrogen industry that's going to do all the things in national economies and in job creation and maintenance that the oil and gas sector does today. Um, and also the same thing, in fact, with coal mining and coal fired power, the future of energy is going to be complicated. It's going to be diverse. Um, we're not necessarily going to go from one thing to just one other thing. While today's jobs in oil and gas are often the best jobs in a country, uh, at the same time, many of these new clean energy companies, especially the ones that have just started, the jobs are not as good as fossil fuel jobs, and the employers are sometimes hostile to unions. So this is nothing new, right? We know that whenever uh, there's a big structural change in an industry or new employers come in, that often it's going to be a big fight to organize those jobs. And we know that these big changes often bring job losses, right? So it's no different in the energy transition, but it's just indeed at a bigger scale. Although many jobs in the oil and gas sector have high skills transfer to clean energy jobs, this is not true everywhere for every job. And the transition, as, as the brother said earlier, is going to require skilling and reskilling and education, right? So it has to be money for that. We shouldn't have to pay for it as workers. Employers and governments need to pay for us to be reskilled. We need to be able to do it um, also while we're getting paid for it. So training while in work. New technologies such as hydrogen raise new health and safety issues that we will probably require new health, safety, and environment regulations and skills. Many unions in many countries in Germany and Japan have already done a lot of work on this, but also older technologies such as sol solar panels need more attention to skills in HSE in different countries. There just isn't enough focus on the risks of installing solar panels. Those risks include fall risks, but also uh, working with high voltages. So overall, we wanna be sure that all of the jobs in clean energy, including jobs in solar installation are good jobs. They need to be skilled jobs, people need training and they need certifications. On the Global Just Transition Agreements, um, we, we did different things, right? So we talked to our affiliates the one, and your affiliates, the ones that organize these big multinational energy companies. Um, we met with some you know, staff at some of these companies. We talked to the United Nations, the UN Secretary General's office. Uh, we talked to uh, other parts of the UN. And what we found out is that most of the big multinational enterprises in energy have not involved unions in developing plans for their climate targets, their decarbonization plans, or in any plans for just transition. And they're not really sharing information about what this all means for our jobs. And so as a result, our affiliates and, and our members mostly don't know when the transition is going to happen, when existing jobs will change or disappear, what the new jobs are going to be, and what the pathways of workers will be to new jobs. 
Furthermore, for energy sector workers in most big oil and gas producing countries, at the moment, there is no social dialogue on just transition climate targets in the future. And that's also why at the start I said that maybe the biggest issue is about our fundamental rights at work, right? Um, some of these big companies have created their own version of just transition, which doesn't involve workers or our representatives. So they have a just transition without workers and without unions. And as Bert said, that's really, that's really not what has been negotiated in the United Nations or what just transition is all about. In some countries, privatization and contractualization of jobs has made social dialogue difficult, if not impossible. And of course, contractualization is also making jobs worse, right? People are going from permanent high quality jobs to jobs on contracts where they have fewer rights and they don't have security of contract. And so these processes have really reduced opportunities for effective collective bargaining, as well as intentional state-driven industrial policy and decarbonization. A few employers in the energy sector, especially those that are state owned, have strong social dialogue. They have agreements and plans for just transition in their home countries, but none have uh, good just transition plans and strong social dialogue requirements in other countries where they operate and certainly not in the supply chain. So we have you know, some strongholds of high union density and good collective bargaining, sometimes even unions and the board in certain countries. But then when these same companies go outside of their home country, sometimes they do whatever and they are also doing whatever in their supply chains. So there is an urgent need for new agreements or legislation or arrangements <coughs> that will cover these workers in international operations and in the gigantic supply chains of multinational oil and energy companies. <coughs> Excuse me. The UN and particularly the UN Secretary General strongly support just transition. But they're also pretty concerned because they too are looking at these targets that are coming from energy sector companies and they're asking, like, where is the detail? How are they really going to meet them? So in order for any global just transition agreement to succeed, it will have to include strong accountability mechanisms. The ILO, as the UN's only tripartite body, might be a natural home for these kinds of agreements convened by the UN Secretary General. So just on to the recommendations. The initiative, we got very strong feedback from, from you, from industrial affiliates and from ITUC affiliates that this initiative should continue in next year. Um, everyone said it provided an important platform for exchanges across regions, national borders, sec sectors and union formations. This combination of national confederations and sector unions seemed to be very effective and to get a very rich discussion and also better at getting alignment across our movement. In the next phase, the initiative could cover other topics. And these are things, again, that you and our affiliates also said were important. There is a lot of interest in a workshop on nuclear power. We agreed, which we agreed to do next year. And also we're working on a workshop specifically for the MANA region on just transition, the energy sector. Um, Clean energy jobs are for everyone. So one thing about jobs and energy is that there is, you know, are gigantic gaps in, in gender, both in the participation of women in these great high quality energy jobs, but also in our pay if we get into the sector. So a potential next phase of the initiative should include gender and racial justice issues to a greater extent and to explore what the union movement can do to make more sure that more women, racialized and young workers get good jobs in clean energy and maybe also equally important, join unions. We need some new tools. So the initiative's focus should shift from sharing information uh, to supporting energy sector unions and getting social dialogue on good jobs and just transition. These global just transition agreements can be a useful tool to promote social dialogue, but to get there, we need the full support of you, the unions that organize these multinational energy companies at home. And we're gonna need buy, full buy-in from the UN Secretary General and a strong tripartite process through the ILO. 
getting real social dialogue is going to mean that we need to work together. So we did it successfully during this initiative over the last however many months. That's because of you, the affiliates and members. Um, we think that by working together, we can uh, support our members and affiliates in getting good jobs and collective agreements for energy sector workers. That's going to require organizing political and campaigning pressure and a strong and united movement. So that's it on uh, on this presentation. I was asked to say something as well about uh, priorities, industrial priorities and just transition. Um, so I'm a little nervous about doing that because I'm speaking to industrial unions. So I feel shy about telling you what your priorities might be, but I'm gonna try to do it anyway, coming out of this discussion that we've had um, in the initiative. So it's very clear, for example, that there's going to be more mining of critical minerals especially, right? And it's going to be essential that the countries that have a lot of these resources, for example, Chile, um, are able to get better agreements, their governments get better agreements with multinational mining companies so that they keep both more of the revenue from these minerals in the country. Uh, there have been discussions about establishing sovereign wealth funds based on revenues from critical minerals, for example, but also that, uh, that they're able to keep more of the jobs, more of the value, the minerals processing in the country as well, so that you don't just have an extractivist model where some countries are importing a lot of critical minerals, um, they're just a you know, their, their companies are extracting them, and then they're bringing them back and all of the jobs and processing and manufacturing are somewhere else. So that's a pretty huge issue. And similarly, we know that we're going to need to have better technology and also better jobs in recovering and recycling um, uh, critical minerals from products that, that have them today. So that's everything from smartphones all the way over to wind turbines and solar panels. So in order to have enough critical minerals for a clean energy economy, you're gonna need more mining. You're also going to need more and better jobs in recovery and recycling. Again, people are working with toxic, uh, toxic minerals. Many of these minerals such as copper are toxic. And so if you're working with them, those jobs have to have very high health, safety, and environment standards. Um, some other industrial priorities. Hydrogen has emerged as something that's important for almost everyone. We need to look under the hood a little bit at what is actually possible with hydrogen. But it seems as if hydrogen is going to be quite important as a potential replacement for natural gas in different, especially in industrial processes. We don't yet know if we're gonna get a commercially viable technology for shipping hydrogen in bulk, right? It's got these little tiny molecules. I'm not an expert, but little tiny molecules. So apparently you need uh, very specialized, very expensive ships in order to transport it long distances. On the other hand, hydrogen that is produced and used in you know, roughly the same larger area it can be transported by pipeline. And again, it can contribute to very big emissions reductions in different countries in industry, potentially in transport and heavy transport, and also maybe as a backup for the power sector. We see the batteries are uh, going to be a huge component of the transition in transport and especially in, in, in light vehicles, uh, light duty vehicles in, in cars, maybe also in heavy transport. So the manufacture of batteries and especially making sure that where car companies are making, you know, where they're sort of setting up their own battery manufacturing companies, that those, those companies are covered by existing collective bargaining agreements. Because what we see is that some of the big auto manufacturers are saying, well, you know, EVs are something completely different. So we're going to like set up a separate entity for that manufacturing, especially batteries. And guess what? Our collective bargaining agreements aren't going to apply to that. So that's not acceptable. Um, some other, some other, uh, some other priorities. 
there there's a lot happening, for example, in the manufacture of steel. However, one of the big issues about making green steel, especially steel that's made with hydrogen, is that you have to have very abundant electricity and it has to be low cost. So you have to have access to a lot of electricity to make uh, green hydrogen. And it also, the cost has to be right. And not every country or facility has that access to low cost electricity. So that's something to think about when, when you're talking about making green steel with, with green hydrogen. Where it's possible to do that, it is going to be a very effective way to decarbonize steel. Um, one other thought is about carbon capture and storage. So the cost of carbon capture and storage is going down. And that means the carbon capture and storage can be an important part of decarbonizing industry, right? So this would be for the sectors where there's no other technology to bring down emissions, yet we need the end result. And that steel is one example, cement would be another, um, maybe the chemicals industry. And so for those purposes, it makes sense and it's likely that we're going to have commercially viable carbon capture and storage. The question is how quickly and how much. What probably isn't going to happen, and we got that feedback quite strongly from a couple of, uh, of, of industrials affiliates at our last meeting, is that you're probably not going to have widespread use of carbon capture and storage to generate uh, electricity from burning coal. So at the moment, it seems like there is very little interest from employers and investors and governments in investing in that. So you might get it in a few places um, where you have industrial clusters and you have carbon capture and storage to get emissions that will capture emissions from industry. And then it makes sense. OK, we could also capture emissions from coal there. But uh, to have it as a sort of widespread solution for emissions from coal fired power probably not going to happen. Still, more work needs to be done on CCS, and it is going to be, over time, a big part of bringing down emissions globally. Um, I guess the last thing to say is that we just want to under I just want to underline some of the things that have already come out. So one is that uh, for just transition to work, you have to have you have to have either a change in your existing good job or a good new job to go to. So the timing matters. Like those things have to be in place before you're gonna, for those of you who are shop stewards or elected leaders, before you're gonna talk to your members about your job disappearing, you wanna be able to tell them what the future is gonna hold. So the point of Just Transition is really that you want to be able to tell your members, the workers at the, at the, at the site, what the new job is going to be, what the future is going to look like for them, how they're going to be taken care of, right? And so that means that the sequence of all of this the timing, what happens first is pretty important. The second thing is that uh, some of these transitions may happen really quickly. So you really can't start planning quickly enough for this, right? We just want to stress that. It's something we heard from everybody. And the third thing is that um, you know, there's an idea that just transition is really, you know, it's just a thing that people are doing in Europe and, and we can't do it everywhere else. But I want to say that you and our ITUC affiliates are proving that that is wrong. We work closely with unions all over the world in Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Nigeria, Indonesia, India. I see General Secretary Zama is on this call. And we know that everybody is working on just transition in your countries. So, that's the last thing I want to say. This is actually something that's for us. It's for all of us. And we hope that this initiative uh, has been useful for you. We're going to put out a report. We'll send it around. Um, and we still, as mentioned, welcome your comments on the conclusions and recommendations. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I, and thanks for introducing this uh, these final remarks. 
about how important it is not only uh, in Europe, this is for everyone. This is the main reason why we are organizing this, this action week because uh, just transition is it's coming for, for everyone, but also not also in the not only in the energy sector, in all the industrial sectors. And we in industrial we represent 14 different sectors, and all of them will be impacted by the by the this transition in, in different measure and in different timing, probably but we will all be impacted by this. So thank you very much, Sam, for this, for this presentation. I would like to open the floor now for specific questions to, to her presentation, if you have any comment or, or question that you want to, to make, you are welcome to make it now. No. If um, if okay, yeah, good day, Jeff. Okay, and Mustafa after that. Okay, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much to Diana and to Samantha for this excellent presentation. Let me say something very briefly. Yes, just transition is coming. It's coming very quickly. And we cannot move fast enough, you are right. And we need therefore to act as unions first. And as unions, we need to be the ones giving momentum to this whole process. In other terms, we need first of all to be organized. We need, and when I say organization, what do I mean exactly by that? We need to move from an old structure to a newer structure. And if this old structure is not able to let us go, and if the new structure is not able to welcome us, then the transition will fail. We need therefore to move from an old organization or structure to a newer one while, while having a sure footing wherever we go. And I fully agree agree with the final words in the presentation. We need to start talking to our unions everywhere across the world. We need to talk to workers because they need to know where they are heading towards. They are not likely to leave their old jobs um, to go towards a newer job unless they know where they're heading towards. And I would add something to what Sam said. Perhaps it's also important to start networking amongst ourselves to know where we're heading towards and to have more strength when we're negotiating. Thank you. Tuknan. Um, Mustafa? Oui, bonjour. Yes, good morning. And thank you very much for the presentations. So we've been following this for a certain amount of time now, so I think we're better understanding the matter. We are following this very interesting debate for African trade unions for a just transition. Terribly sorry, an interference. Hello? Can you hear me? So, I think there is we, this is very important for the concerns of African countries as well as for developed countries. Regarding just transition, we fully agree here. As it is a matter of concern to us all, it is very important for all inhabitants on the planet. It's just mathematical. It's not for us as Africans to say, well, there is no need for industrialization. We really, we just should not just sit back and cross our arms. We have from the very outset be concerned by this global warming problem. And uh, it's important that this reflection group on just transition is very interesting for us. I would like to talk as a technician because I'm working in a chemical plant. I'm making 
phosphoric acid. We have to recognize that certain African countries of West uh, Africa, Senegal, Ghana, and maybe also Nigeria, have discovered that they have important fossil energy. So they will probably soon be self-sufficient regarding energy. And this will make it possible to be in a better economic situation and no longer depend on imports for fossil energies. So how can we integrate these two situations? The situation which allows our countries, African countries, that have need sufficient uh, fossil products and the just transition. My question is, how us trade unions can we do about this situation? Okay, we found fossil energy and we can produce energy thanks to this fossil energies because all the uh, uh, plants we have are thermal plants. So how can we use this energy that we have in our countries and bring this in line with a just transition? That is my question. So thanks for the thanks for the questions. Um, I think so. You asked the hard question, Mustafa, right? Uh, and this is the uh, and this is the this is the this is the big one. So I think two things. I mean, one is that uh, probably the exploitation of oil and gas, newly discovered oil and gas reserves in African countries, right? So the extraction and use of those reserves, that might not be the biggest and most urgent climate change issue we have. That That's one perspective. The other perspective, though, is that, and I've I worked in the oil and gas industry. So the other perspective is that the time from when you discover a field to when it actually comes on stream and is producing um, is a while, right? So those newly discovered reserves, they might not be producing any oil and gas and uh, not, you know, they'll create some jobs in the process of developing them, but they won't be bringing in revenue to the government in the form of, of licensing fees and so on, like real revenue for a while. And the question is, like, what is the future of that asset going to be, like, not only 10 years from now, but 20, 30, and 40 years from now? We don't have an answer to that question. What we do know, though, is that um, it is, uh, you know, everything that we know about the science of climate change tells us that we're not going to be able to burn oil and gas in the same amounts that we do today, even indefinitely, right? The emissions are too high. And we also know that um, we, in a lot of countries, we're now starting to see a pretty rapid transition uh, away from the use of petrol and internal combustion engines and towards electric vehicles. So we're starting to see this transition, whether it's to hydrogen or whether it's to EVs or biofuels. And that's, that means, you know, most likely that at some point we're also going to see a decline in demand for oil, although there will still be demand for oil and petrochemicals uh, production, and also for oil as, as a raw material in uh, things like uh, asphalt and so on. So, um, so I think I think two things about your question. I mean, I think nobody can tell any African government what resources it should or should not produce, right? That's a national decision. Um, I think is I think as well though that uh, if if we're if any oil and gas producing country is thinking right now, okay, fifty years from now, forty years from now, even thirty years from now. We're going to be producing as much oil and gas as as we are today, or a lot more. They might be wrong about that, right? So, as workers, the best strategies we can have are to try to look into the future and to think about: okay, there are these jobs in oil and gas now, but what are the other jobs that are 
going to bring down emissions and be good jobs for members also in the also in a future where we really are doing something meaningful about climate change. I know it's not a super satisfactory answer, but uh, it's an honest answer, right? We can't tell our members that everything's going to continue exactly as it is right now because we have already seen in the last few years that that's not going to happen. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, and I and I think that because this is not a very positive answer, but it's but it's true. It needs the, how the future looks like. That's why we are here talking about all this and the best way to to have this transition and the less painful for for workers is what we should look for. Um, do you have any other question, comment? Anyone wants to say something? Specific questions for Samantha? Okay, so we would like to, to stop for a very short break and give you some time to think. We have already mentioned the, the entire uh, action week that we are developing and also the plans that we have, but we also want to, to hear from you. And what do you think that uh, I mean that are the key points for the for our strategy to to be developing in this in this area in the area of of the just transition in all the sectors not only in the energy sector but how are your unions going to to face all these changes and we would like to hear from you so we are going to stop for ten minutes for a healthy break uh, just straight uh, stretch your legs take some some coffee some tea. And come back in 10 minutes. We will continue with the with the debate, the discussion. Don't please don't disconnect because it will be difficult to connect everyone again. Don't disconnect and see you in, in 10 minutes. Thank you. And here we have uh, we have already had our healthy break. And now we go through the second part of this uh, first uh, webinar on just transition and, and our priorities for the industrial sectors. Um, as I was mentioning before, we wanted to hear from you. Uh, what do you think? Where is the point or where is your union right now regarding the just transition or what is happening in your country? What, what do you need? What do you think that industrial uh, can do for you and, and how we can support you in the, in the different processes that, uh, that you are uh, passing by? So we would like to open the floor to have more interventions and, and to open the discussion. I, I also invite uh, our Assistant General Secretary Khan uh, to, to respond questions if needed. Also, Samantha is, is here during the, the debate. So, so yeah, you are all welcome to, to talk. So I would like to, to hear from you. Okay, Luis Fernando. Hola, buenos días. ¿Qué tal? Good morning. I'm Luis Fernando. I'm from the National Mining Union and Steel Workers of Mexico. I have a question on what Samantha was saying with regard to underdeveloped countries. How would it affect us when there are innovations in developed countries and oil consumption goes down? How would this affect workers in that consumption would go down and then there are underdeveloped countries that only or primarily export oil whose consumption would be affected and as they're underdeveloped they wouldn't be mining other resources like lithium for example um, with new energies and batteries so that's my question what would be the impact on the economies of underdeveloped countries and 
especially workers, how would they feel this change? Thank you very much and greetings. Thank you, Luis Fernando. Do you want to take the question now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, again, uh, I'm I'm going to be I'm going to give you a real answer or the best answer I can give you, right? So if um, and also, as I said, coming from the oil industry myself and and living in a country, Norway, which you know is very dependent on oil production and those jobs, although uh, although also a rich country. Um, so as oil demand from uh, not only from from developed countries, from richer countries goes down, but also in other countries, right? So in middle income countries, uh, you can expect, and you're already seeing, for example, in Brazil, you know, pushes towards biofuel and hydrogen in transport, then there is going to be there is going to be less demand for oil. And um it is more or less a globally traded commodity. So the countries that are producing the cheapest oil most likely are gonna be the ones who will still be meeting that demand and other countries with higher costs of production, um, such as Norway, like the oil that they're exporting is not gonna, you know, that's gonna be what drops out as demand shrinks. But yeah, it will have a lot of impacts. And so, um, and especially especially on workers in countries where big parts of the economy are very dependent on oil and gas production. You know, I know a lot of revenue comes out of Pemex into the Mexican government. It pays for a lot of things. That's true in Nigeria as well. Uh, that was true with Petrobras, uh, not under the Bolsonaro regime. But uh, Petrobras also, the revenues from Petrobras also funded a lot of good things in the Brazilian state. So the only um, the only insight that I have, and not that I'm an expert on the macroeconomics of oil and gas producing states, is that it's important to work already on plans to diversify the economy and maybe starting from within the state-owned enterprise, right? Um, because, you know, I know that Pemex in the past maybe still has some investments in, for example, wind and renewable energy. There's a huge discussion about the role of the state in producing renewable energy in Mexico. And so one way to try to keep the good jobs and the good collective bargaining uh, relationships that we have in today's oil and gas structures is to push as trade unionists for those structures to diversify their assets and to start investing some of their money in hydrogen, in carbon capture and storage, in generating electricity through clean energies and so on, right? That would be a sort of good first step in any, especially state-owned enterprise where we have some say over what the, what the company does next. Thank you, Sam. Um, Ala from Iraq. Uh, thank you very much. The previous uh, colleagues have mentioned what the trade unions will do and what workers will do in the future. I have already mentioned that the government in the future wishes to transition towards clean energy and of course to have just transition and it did set out plans. As for workers, as you know, to every action there is a reaction and after the government's uh, action, the workers and since we are developing a developing country and we depend on oil production in 90% of our uh, budget, knowing that we do not produce gas, we are an oil producing country and the sector of uh, gas, we do not depend on it, uh, we do not produce it, but we import gas from Iran. So I think gas will not be part of the just uh, uh, transition. 
Here I'm focusing on the oil sector. The workers will be under enormous pressure during the just transition process. It is true that uh, we are going towards a transformation, towards a new era where we'll be less dependent on oil. What the government is supposed to do is to work with trade and unions in order to see how we can move on and away from oil. We, as trade unions, we can do nothing before the government. We need the assistance of international organizations such as industrial or any other entity to assist us as workers to raise their skills, to raise their awareness, to know what solutions they may reach with the government. As things are going currently, we do not have a role to play and our future looks gloomy because we do not have trade unions that are strong enough to acquire the rights of the workers. I'm being very blunt and honest with you. Workers in Iraq are completely marginalized and excluded by the Iraqi government. There are even laws combating any right to association. We want to put all our efforts on empowering the workers and the trade unions. We stand strongly against the government and there are laws that would imprison us, but still we are standing stronger and we want your help. Thank you. What I, what I can say, brother or comrade, is, is that, you know, we'll do the things that we can do that might assist you, right? So it's not going to be probably everything or enough, but it's a start. So we committed to having a workshop on just transition, the energy sector for the MANA region, um, in part exactly to talk about the issues that you're raising uh, from Iraq, but also from other countries where there is no social dialogue. The government's trying to crush the trade unions. So we're going to start there. We're going to be raising these issues as well, at the, as well at the climate negotiations in Egypt, as Bert said, but also to have a workshop that is really, you know, for your region to try to work out together what are some of the things that the trade union movement can do internationally to support you. Yeah, thank you, Sam. But also, what all what uh, you were mentioning is what um, what we talk at the beginning uh, about the the guide of practice that we have developed in just transition. When we talk about all this just transition, it looks like everyone has to be at the same stage and and suffering the same things. And and no, we are aware that that this is not happening, and that each of you, each of your unions, each of your countries are in different positions. And because of that, that, is, that guide um, could help you. And no matter the, the, the step you are, that you can, you can take information from there. You can start, whatever is your, is your position, you can start um, trying to get the dialogue or different, different commitments from different, different um, sides of the, of the, the counterparts in order to get this, this dialogue and, and different possibilities. But as uh, Sam mentioned, uh, yeah, we are going to, we are here to, to support you and to do as much as we, as we can. Um, Mustafa, please take the floor. Oui, bonjour et merci donc. Hello, and thank you for those replies. Uh, I wasn't able to come back on that. I have a couple of points on what uh, Samantha's just said. I send you warm regards. She talked about hydrogen production and batteries with thermal engines, obviously as part of the just transition These batteries require a lot of energy in production and to make it profitable in the just transition, uh, fossil fuels will need to be used to make batteries. So I have a question on hydrogen production. 
and the technical procedures required and the amount of fossil fuels that are required. The interpreter regrets that the sound quality is not excellent. We've tried to capture as much as possible now. Voilà, j'ai terminé ma question. That was uh, the end of my question. Yeah, well, so um, thank you. Warm greetings back. And, and also thanks everybody for engaging in a, in a real discussion, right? Um, and asking the hard questions. So uh, in, in this period where we're all trying to build this clean energy economy, right? So that where you're changing industrial processes, making batteries, um, producing new electric vehicles, building wind turbines and all their structures, making uh, cabling for new grids, so on. That's a lot of industrial production. And indeed, right now, that's going to require fossil fuels, right? Like we can't, build stuff right now. We don't have the te technology right now to build all the things we need for a clean energy economy without using certainly natural gas. So, um, and the other thing that we're seeing right now is that natural gas prices are super high, which makes it hard to invest in this industrial production that we need because natural gas prices are so high. The thing that we don't know, right, is what is the price of natural gas going to be three, five, or 10 years from now? And I'm saying that we don't know that because, uh, you know, if anyone had told us, you know, a few years ago that natural gas prices would be so high and that there would be a huge market for liquefied natural gas, we would all have been like, yeah, okay, no, you know, that's not going to happen. Natural gas prices are low, but now they are high. So the one, the one thing I would say about it is that uh, indeed we need fossil fuels now in this period where we are trying to build the future. The question is how much are we going to need and which ones in the future? And also like, what is the supply gonna be? Um, we have a particular situation right now because of, of this war um, that, that's going on in Ukraine. Um, we don't know how long that situation lasts or what it's going to mean for natural gas prices going in, into the future, or alternatively, how quickly some of these uh, transitions in the power sector and in industrial process are going to happen that might also reduce demand for natural gas. But I think if you're, you know, if you're looking like five, 10 years into the future, then yeah, absolutely, we need gas for industrial production. I, I don't know if that answers or responds to your comment. Yes, clear. I've understood. Thank you very much for that answer. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Butayev. Thank you very much, Diana. And we thank you, Samantha, for your uh, presentation. I have a series of questions, if you may. I would like to understand some of the basic uh, questions. The first and most important question for me is based on the capacity buildings of individuals so that we can transform them into capacities that would be able to create from them a union action power. From here, we must understand that we need first to have a clear vision. We need to have a plan of action that is translated into action on the ground to be able to achieve that. Currently, we are taking our first steps towards this new knowledge of just transition. We need to know what we want. We need to know what we should do in order to reach the phase we all aspire to. 
we are working against time. Time is passing quickly. We need to work very fast. Because transition is coming and it's coming soon so that we are able to bridge the gap between us and what is being plotted against us. If our first step is a misstep, we will never be able to reach the transition and the change that we aspire to. And in order to reach just transition according to how we view it, we need to have several inputs. The first input needs to be the vision, then the skills, then the incentives, then the resources, and then a plan of action. These are the steps. If we do not have a clear vision of where we are, where we're going, if we do not have the studies, the data, the figures in every country, with the government, with the, the industry, up until the, we reach a plan of action, we will not be able to achieve that change. If one thing is lacking, it will be a misstep. If we do not have a vision, if we do not have the skills, if we do not have the incentives, we will find resistance. If we do not have financial and human resources, we will be frustrated. And if we do not have a plan of action, then our journey will fail. And this is why we need to set a roadmap based on clear, sound foundations to be able to achieve success. Thank you. So, so thanks very much, comrade. I think uh, when, one quick response to that is that, as, as many of you know, our movement has, we have our own think tanks. We have, in some countries, our own uh, economic modelers. Um, or those who are friendly to us who are also producing information about these different pathways in the energy sector and about the number and about the number of jobs that are coming. I think another question is when do the jobs come, right? Like it's great to hear there are going to be, you know, however many million jobs um, uh, that are created, but we need to know when those jobs are coming in order to be able to have this conversation with the members about, okay, this is happening and, you know, here's the new job that's opening up in this company and there's going to be a training program and you're going to go straight into this new job, which is the same quality as the one you have right now, right? So we need to know also about the timing. And then finally, we need to know, uh, like, what does it take to get those new jobs? Like what kinds of investments have to be made by the company or the government and so on? So on the one hand, I agree, it's a lot of information. We do have information though, just in our movement, not even from the expert agencies, but from our, from our, from our own movement uh, that uh, when, you know, we've been trying to share in this process that we talked about. And I guess the other thing I would say is that, you know, if, if we're, on the other hand, if we wait until we have a sort of like all the information and a perfect plan, the employers are ahead of us, right? Sorry to say it, but they are. And so uh, we need to build the plane a little bit while we're flying. So that means that we have to, uh, in my view, right? I can't tell anyone what to do, but I really feel strongly about this. We have to try to organize the new jobs. We have to understand where are those new jobs coming coming from. We have to organize them. We have to push our current employers to start to invest in some of these new technologies so we keep the good jobs in those companies and they're robust no matter what happens, right? So that would be my advice. It's about organizing. It's about uh, pushing our, the good employers we have today to take action on climate so that we keep those good jobs in the companies we already organize. And it's about uh, doing what we can as international solidarity to support our comrades and sisters and brothers in countries like Iraq, where uh, their, you know, the ability of workers to have good jobs, be safe at work, have a decent life, it's pretty small because of what the government's doing and the and the multinational employers. So this would be my this would be that would be my advice, right? We have to do all of these things at once, unfortunately. 
Thank you very much, Sam. And I will. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm speaking to you uh, in my capacity as an uh, electrical uh, mechanic engineer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Budaya, for your for your comments. Always very accurate. Um, yeah, I was going to say that I will take it where Sam has leave it. Uh, and it's about information. This is all of what we are discussing here today is about information. All what we need is to know, is to know where we are and to know what it's happening and to know the plans that we have for the future. But also it will, th this information is power and this information will give us the, the best position to demand the, to, the, to the governments and to the employers uh, the information that they have what are they planning? What are their plans in the, in the short, in the medium term, in the long term? And where are we in those plans? Because we cannot forget that our place is at the table. There is nowhere else. We have to be there at the table in order to make our voice raised and in order to, to make them to, to listen to us and to get commitments where we are part of, of them. So I would like to, to leave it here as well. We are very well on time. And I would like now to, to finish this, to close this, this discussion session, this debate. I think that it has been very, very comprehensive and, and, and fruitful. And I would like to give the floor now to, to Kan Matsusaki again, to give us the, the final comments and, and the closing remarks. So Kan, over to you. Yes, thank you, Diana, and thank you very much also for uh, Samantha and Bers, uh, you know, for your valuable uh, input and, and and also the comprehensive, uh, you know, um, how do you say the presentation that what we will aim at the uh, the COP twenty seven, uh, which stimulate I think uh, you know today's discussion, and we we uh, have corrected uh, you know quite many constructive and fruitful uh comment uh, from the uh, participants so i think uh, you know thank you very much for uh, that contribution today um for for um the comment actually this uh how we can uh, make it clear how we can build a clear plan of action on the just transition in your country i think this is a very very crucial point uh, that we actually uh, uh, get comment today um the other day uh, Diana and myself uh, organized um, uh, the workshop on just transition together with Industrial European Trade Union in Turkey. And we had a quite a deep discussion uh, with the Turkey Union. And what we found out is that uh, there was no social dialogue on the, uh, no proper social dialogue on the just transition between the government employer and the union in Turkey. And there's no proper uh, clear data or the figure uh, on how they will achieve their country NDC, uh, the national determined uh, the contribution in the Turkey. So union actually don't know how they will demand a just transition uh, in their company, in their sector and to the government. So that is the, uh, uh, the, the very difficult point. And I would very much a concern about this social dialogue because social dialogue is actually heavily connected to the fundamental workers' rights. So if you take a look at you know, uh, the fundamental workers' rights violation, uh, then that would be heavily connected to no social dialogue in your country. So uh, this is a kind of uh, you know what we always think about as a trade unionist, how uh, we can develop our solidarity movement and how this international tra uh, trade union movement can support your country, your union to, 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 to secure uh, the fundamental workers, right? And secure the right to the social dialogue. So I think that that is first step. The next step, uh, we actually pretty much clear that they you know uh, we need to phase out from the fossil fuel as soon as possible to secure uh, our future. But in that case, uh, we already know what kind of technology or what kind of new uh, energy is available uh, in the next phase. But the, the most the difficult question is, 
who will be your negotiation partner when your country introduces renewable energy? For example, now, uh, if you are oil and gas workers, uh, and, and, and maybe your negotiation partner is a big oil or, or gas company, or maybe your negotiation partner is the state it, uh, or the government. But when uh, the, we phase out from the, uh, the fossil fuel, uh, fuel uh, from oil, gas, gas, and mining, then move towards to renewable energy, uh, I have one uh, example. For example, solar power, solar photovoltaic. Uh, if you think about so solar photovoltaic, I think uh, you know many of the country would like to introduce this solar energy uh, to achieve the the part of country energy C. But when you think about the supply chain uh, of the solar uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaic uh, you know supply chain. From the raw material, process material, component to assembly of solar photovoltaic, uh, already more than half of this supply chain is dominated by one country, which is China. And Chinese company is heavily investing uh, this, uh, you know, uh, the renewable energy field. So when you think about when your country introduce solar energy instead of fossil fuel, then who will then your new negotiation partner? So this is kind of a next, next question. Uh, we need to prepare who will be your next negotiation partner. So that's why we need to have due diligence, human like due diligence process in the supply chain and also the uh, just transition. Because whoever, your uh, negotiation partner will be, we need to have a concrete strong tools uh, on the due diligence. So uh, in the next tomorrow, uh, actually we will uh, have a session, webinar session, fight for just transition through the supply chain and in the regions. So we will also talk about why due diligence is important to achieve this just transition in the supply chain. And we will also focusing on uh, the mining energy sectors uh, and how we can achieve concretely the just transition processes. And we will have a very specific focus on the MENA and Sub-Saharan Africa region, which is, we think is the most vulnerable uh, region uh, in terms of this, uh, the just transition processes. So, um, I think the, the, there was a very good discussion today, and uh, uh, we uh, I take a note of all of your comment, and uh, this is very valuable input to read the next discussion tomorrow, uh, which is session number two uh, for the supply chain and the regions. So uh, if we have a time, please also uh, participate tomorrow's session, uh, which is the uh, same time, uh, which was exactly the same time tomorrow. Then, uh, the last three, I would like to uh, introduce our campaign uh, in coming 4th of November. So I will share my screen now. Oh, let me just... Uh... So uh, I, I think you are seeing my screen, which is on a website. So uh, if you have a time, uh, please visit our website. So now this is a homepage. Um, as Diana already mentioned, uh, we actually recently published this a trade union guide for the practice for just transition. So when you click the, this uh, the guide, then you will jump to uh, this guide. So uh, we will plan to have this guide in several uh, different languages. So I assume uh, that you can find uh, the language of the just transition, the just guided practice in your uh, uh, own languages. So uh, when you read this, uh, the guided practice, uh, please uh, go to the checklist. Uh, we have a checklist in that uh, guideline so that you will know where your union are in the just, just transition process. I think this is the first step that we, uh, we need to take uh, in your countries. But uh, for uh, our campaign, uh, if you if you go to what we do, then please click uh, to uh, this 
just transition page. Then we have this uh, just transition page. Then if you go scroll down, then we will also introducing this initiative for just transition in the energy sector together with ITUC and Norway ELO, Industrial Rural Union. And uh, we also uh, put it on other uh, uh, aspect, which is a gender transformative and inclusive just transition. Or uh, we also uh, put the information uh, on the renewable energy, what kind of uh, uh, industry, what kind of a uh, job will be created uh, in this uh, you know, renewable energy. So those are the information that you get from this uh, website. But most importantly, as I mentioned, uh, this section, so we will have, we will participate uh, together with ITUC and uh, together with other GUF uh, at COP27. COP then as I mentioned, uh, we will have this uh, the social media storm. So please help us to raise labor voices by being active on this social media before and during this COP27 conference. Especially, please join our social media storm on the seventh of uh, on the fourth of November, which is coming this Friday. Uh, then um, you will see uh, many kind of uh, you know uh, you can download uh, on our just transition poster, which will be available in English, French, and Spanish. And you can uh, I want you to take picture uh, on holding those posters uh, with your union members. Then please send us those uh, pictures. And and these are the the, the sample message. For example, United to a Just Future uh, Trade Union will be at uh, COP27 to demand just transition for, for the workers and communities, or uh, to prevent uh, disastrous climate change. Uh, we need to trans transition to our economies to net zero, a trade union must be part of the plan to make this happen. Let's create new high quality green union jobs. Or who will pay for just transition? Time for uh, the leads to pay up. A union will be at COP27 to uh, demand a climate finance to build a just future for all. And Confused by uh, COP27, so download the trade union guide of practice that we uh, it, which, which, which is available uh, on, our, on our website. So these are the uh, the campaign that we will have uh, you know coming um, uh, day a few days and especially on the fourth of November. Please join us this uh, social media storm. So. Um, I think this is the all from my side. And uh, thank you very much again for uh, Samantha and Burst uh, for um, you know, joining us uh, on this uh, webinar. And thank you very much for your uh, valuable input. And thank you very much for the older sisters and brothers for your valuable uh, and constructive input so that we can, uh, this uh, comment uh, definitely help us to, 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 to develop uh, the tomorrow's discussion uh, on the supply chain and the regions. And uh, also thank you very much for the uh, interpreters uh, who actually help uh, always uh, you know, uh, help us to make a bridge uh, between different languages uh, to, uh, to this uh, you know, uh, constructive dis discussion happening. So um, thank you very much for all for, all, uh, for participating in this meeting. And I hope if we have a time and um, see you tomorrow at the, uh, the tomorrow's uh, the webinar. Thank you very much.